Well, please open your Bible again at 2 Samuel in chapter 4. We are following the story in the Bible of how David brought the 12 tribes of Israel together and made them as one, as one people and as one nation. And you'll remember from the story that God had anointed David as the king over his people. But at the beginning, there was only one of the 12 tribes that were ready to receive him. And the question was, how then would the others be brought under the blessing of King David's rule? And we saw that the very first thing that King David did was to reach out sending messengers of grace to the people least likely to receive him. That was the very first thing that he did. Now, as we uh, look at uh, this story, we're using it as a lens, and surely this is why it's in the Bible for us today. You say, well, what has this got to do with us today? Well, it's a lens through which we are able to look at the bigger picture in the Bible story, which is, of course, all about how people today from every tribe and language and nation are brought together as one under the blessing of the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. How does that happen? How did David's kingdom come? And in asking that question from the Old Testament, we are given light with regards to how the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ will indeed come. How will people be brought under the blessings of the rule of Jesus Christ, God's anointed king? Now, in the story that follows, there are really three answers. Two of them are in the negative. In other words, how the kingdom does not come. And in our world today, these answers, the negative answers, are really important. And then we will come to the positive answer that is given to us, how the kingdom will come, how it does move forward. And so, in the story, there is very clear direction for Christians today about how we are and how we are not to go about the mission that has been trusted to us by our King Jesus in the world today. Now, I do hope you'll have your Bible open, and I want to begin just by way of review so we get the flow of the story, because the first negative answer to the question, how does the kingdom come? In other words, the first, how the kingdom doesn't come, was in the story that we looked at last week. And we learned there that Christ's kingdom does not come through the cunning of human schemes. That was the point of 2 Samuel in chapter 3. Remember, we looked at the story of Abner. Abner was always about himself. And when the house of Saul that he'd been serving became weaker and weaker, Abner came to the conclusion that he couldn't get what he wanted from Ishbosheth, and so he decided to switch sides. I'll go wherever I can get what I want. And so he decides that he's going to come over to David. And so we saw in chapter 3 and verse 12, Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, To whom does the land belong? Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you and bring all Israel over to you. So, you see, here's how Abner thinks the kingdom comes. Abner thinks that David's throne will be established by Abner. Well, I don't think so. And we found last time that that was absolutely not the case. It was the Lord who had promised to establish David's throne. It was the Lord who would bring the kingdom to David, not Abner. And we saw the great significance of this story that for all the self-confidence of this great man, Abner, I'm the one who can get you where you want to go. I'm the one who can get the success that you're after. For all his self-confidence, by the end of the day, Abner was dead. And not a single person, let alone a single tribe, came into the kingdom of David as a result of the activity of Abner. Not a single one. Why? Because the kingdom does not advance by the cunning of men's deceitful scheming, and that is right at the center of the story of Abner. That's why we have in the New Testament in regards to the ministry of the church, our ministry for Christ today, we have these words, we renounce disgraceful and underhanded ways. 
We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word, but by an open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. So, that's the first negative answer. Um, Christ's kingdom does not come through the cunning of human schemes. And we all need to take that to heart today, and especially when it comes to Christian leadership. Here's how it speaks to us. Any leader who thinks that his or her gifts or influence, or program, or ministry is what Christ needs to get His kingdom moving forward, better go read the story of Abner, uh, which makes very, very clear that the Lord establishes His own kingdom, and He doesn't need the arrogance of the Abners who think they're the answer to everything to bring it about. Christ's kingdom does not advance through the cunning of human schemes. Now, that's a reflection on last time. Today, we're going to get the second negative answer, and this is the focus of our time today. We'll move on to the positive one next week. We'll just glance at the positive this week. But the second negative answer, and this is of huge importance for our world and for our culture today, Christ's kingdom does not advance through acts of violence. That's not how it comes. Never. Christ's kingdom never advances through acts of violence. And what we're looking at today is a gruesome story of how some men thought they could advance David's kingdom through an act of violence, a morbid, miserable, gruesome act of violence. There are three scenes in this story. The first, panic, the second, violence, and the third, judgment. First, then, the scene of panic in verse 1. When Ishbosheth, Saul's son, heard that Abner had died at Hebron, his courage failed, and all Israel was dismayed. Now, remember, Abner was the one who had made Ishbosheth king, a rival king to God's anointed king, David. And without Abner, with Abner gone, Ishbosheth knew that he could not stay in power for very long. He was a puppet, as it were, on the hand of Abner. And when he heard that Abner had died, we're told his courage failed. And notice the effect of courage failing in a leader. When the leader's courage failed, we read, and all Israel was dismayed. The whole people thought, what in the world are we going to do now? The first calling of any leader is to exercise faith in God. The first calling of any leader is to exercise faith in God. When the early church wanted to appoint their very first leaders in Acts in chapter 6, and they were looking to select people who would give leadership to ministry. The very first person they chose was a man by the name of Stephen, and we're told about him that he was full of faith, full of faith. The first calling of a Christian leader is to exercise faith in God. Here's what that means. There will be times of crisis in your family, among your friends, in your business, in your ministry. And when these times come, the people who look to you for leadership need to know that you are trusting in God. If they can see that you are looking to the Lord in this time of crisis, they are going to be lifted. If they have the sense that your courage fails, then what's going to happen? They are going to be dismayed. They'll say, even the leader seems to have his faith rocked here. So, what's going to come of us? Now, why was it that Ishbosheth's courage failed? Well, very obviously because he'd put his trust in Abner and not in the Lord. Abner had made him king, and Ishbosheth had always relied on Abner. Now, that leads to this very practical application. Let me ask you straight out here is there a person in your life? 
of whom you might be tempted to say or think, if it wasn't for him or her, I don't know what I would do. If it wasn't for him or her, I, I don't think I could survive. Remember this. Throughout your life, God will give you wonderful gifts of friends and colleagues and loved ones to whom you rightly look for wisdom and for counsel and for help and for comfort. These people are God's gift to you. God gave them to you. Now, don't make an idol out of God's gift. Rejoice in the gifts. Trust in the giver. And you see, that's absolutely what Ishbosheth failed to do. He had this strength that came from someone next to him, and because he put his confidence in that person, when they were gone, well, he didn't know what to do. Ishbosheth very simply made an idol of Abner, and when his idol fell, he was without courage and all Israel was dismayed. Here's how the Psalms put it. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Well, David could say that out of his own experience, couldn't he? He trusted in the Lord, and the Lord never failed him. Now, at this point of the story where um, there's a panic everywhere, uh, two men by the names of Bana and Rechab, take the center stage in the story. These men are also in a panic. They were, we're told in verse 2, captains of raiding bands, which may mean that they had prominent positions in the army of Ishbosheth. If that's the case, and Abner, who was the commander, was uh, uh, now dead, it may have been that these two, Bana and Rechab, were actually senior people, perhaps even next in line, uh, of military rank uh, in the army of uh, Ishbosheth. And rather like Abner, they also find that as Saul's house gets weaker and weaker now, even Ishbosheth has lost his courage and everyone's dismayed, these guys realize that they have a problem. We're on the wrong side, and if we just sit around here, it's going to be the end of us. And so they're asking this question, now what will happen if we just wait here and eventually as this kingdom crumbles, we fall into the hand of David? What will happen when we fall into the hand of the one whose rule we have resisted and whose reign we have opposed? And so they come to a decision. They say, here's what we're going to do. We need to do something really big that will make a huge impression on David and will cause him to embrace us and welcome us. And if we can do something really big, then that will be the way in which our standing with him is secured. And so from scene one, in which they're in a panic, we move to scene two, in which we have this awful act of violence that I will describe only very briefly. Now, the sons of Rumen, verse 5, Rechab and Bana, they set out, and about the heat of the day, they came to the house of Ishbosheth as he was taking his noonday rest. So, here we have a record in the Bible of yet another cold blooded murder. Last weekend, the police recorded the 500th murder in our city this year. The Bible really, really does speak to the painful realities of our city and of our world today. This is the world in which we live. Bana and Rechab were trusted men in Ishbosheth's army. And so, of course, they had access into the king's house. They were used to going in and out to pick up supplies, and nobody would have thought anything of it if these people who were regular uh, visitors to that location uh, came in. 
But on this occasion, instead of going into the store of food, they walk straight into the king's bedroom and they kill him while he is lying on his bed. And then in this particularly gruesome act that has repeated resonance for us today, they took the head of Ishbosheth in order to present it as a trophy, they thought, to David. It was the most obscene act of violence. Now, scene three, we come to the judgment. Scene one, the panic. Scene two, the violence. Scene three, the judgment. They now arrive in the presence of God's anointed king. And I want you to notice two things here, uh, the case that they pre pre uh, present and the king that they have to face. Notice the case that they present. Now, remember, these are folks who have been on the other side, and so they're having to make a case in order to uh, endear themselves to David. They're trying to get on his good side, and so they're presenting the case as to why they should be received and even rewarded and honored for this great thing that they think they have done. They said, verse 8, to the king. Can you picture this? It's awful. Here is the head of Ishbosheth the son of Saul, your enemy, you see, who sought your life. See, they're, they're, they're entering into the presence of God's anointed king, thinking that in their act of violence, they have done the greatest thing, and that they're there to receive their reward. We've dealt with your enemies, they say. These are ruthless men. They have lived their lives believing that might is right and that the end justifies the means. They imagine, of course, that everybody else is like them, and in particular that David is like them and that David will rejoice in what they have done and that David will care very little about the means by which they did it. And they are wrong on both accounts. Rechab and Banna assume that David only cares about one thing, success. What they found to their shock was that this king cares about righteousness. In a world that only cares too often about what will work, Christ calls his people to really care about what is right. Seek first the kingdom of God, what comes next, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, says Jesus. One writer says very perceptively and helpfully, make sure you love righteousness more than you love success. Is that true of you? Do you love righteousness more than success? You see, if you love success more than righteousness, you won't care how you get success. But if you love righteousness more than you love success, you will sometimes forego a success that you could have had because you say, the path to it is not one that I can go down. It's simply not right. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote very powerfully about the idolatry of success, which is really what we're dealing with in this story here. And remember that Bonhoeffer was writing at the time of Hitler's Third Reich. And he was combating the notion that had increase, it was increasingly prevailing amongst more and more people that something is justified if it's successful. In other words, he says that's a kind of doctrine of justification by success, not justification by Jesus Christ and Him crucified, justification by success. That as long as something is successful, that in the end, the means by which it is accomplished actually will fade into the mist of history, and, and so actually it's the success of a thing that actually justifies whatever it was. Let me quote to you from him. 
says Bonhoeffer. Success, he's writing of his day and the culture that he was seeking to combat. Success justifies wrongs done. Success heals the wounds of guilt. There is no sense in reproaching the successful man for his unvirtuous behavior, for this world, for this would be to remain in the past while the successful man strides on from one deed to the next, conquering the future while securing irrevocably what has been done. When a successful figure becomes especially prominent, and conspicuous, the majority give way to the idolization of success. That becomes the great God, he says. Then the moral faculty is blunted because it is dazzled by the brilliance of the successful man and by some longing that people have to share in his success. Then he says this, the figure of Christ crucified invalidates every thought that takes success as its standard. Neither the triumph of the successful nor the bitter hatred which the successful arouse in the hearts of the unsuccessful can ultimately overcome the world. You see, all these divisions in society, the successful, the unsuccessful, the, the hatred that's generated, and the idolization of success is at the root of both. And Bonhoeffer says, writing at the time of the Third Reich, neither can overcome the world. Christ confronts all thinking in terms of success and failure with the man who is under God's sentence, no matter whether he be successful or unsuccessful. Now, you see, Bana and Rechab just assume that like them, David only can ca cares about one thing, and that is success. And to their absolute horror, when they arrive in the presence, arrive in the presence of God's anointed king, they find out that they are completely and utterly wrong. Not only are they wrong about God's anointed king, they are also wrong about God themselves. Look at the second part of this case that they present. Um, verse 8, the Lord, they say to David, and that's the name for the covenant God, Yahweh, the, the Lord, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He has avenged my Lord the King this day on Saul and on his offspring. You see what they're doing? They're claiming the name of God for their grisly act of murder. They say, we did it in the name of God. They associate God with their crime. This is called, and it's in the Ten Commandments, taking the name of God in vain. That's what it is. And so not only have they broken the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder, they break right here the third commandment, taking the name of God in vain. Now, surely the story of Bana and Rechab speaks very, very powerfully into our culture today when we see men perpetrating acts of violence in the name of God, fully believing that they will be rewarded in heaven greatly for what they have done. And that is all around us, and this passage of Scripture speaks right into that most agonizing problem that our world is facing today. Now, the God of Bana and the God of Rechab, of course, is a God who, in their minds, approves anything that they do, which raises the question, and this is really important for us to grasp as Christians, how then does a person know what God approves? How do we know what God's for and what He's against? How do we know what God wants done in the world, especially in a world where everybody seems to claim that God is on their side? 
when Bana and Rechab simply assume that God is for the grisly act of murder that they have committed, what are they doing? They're putting themselves in the place of God. They they carry in their minds and in their imaginations a God who is simply a reflection of their own image, a projection of their own imagination, an echo of their own voice. This is not, the the God of Bana and Rechab is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and certainly not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. How would you know, how would anyone in the world know if what God wants is different from what they want? How would a person know, how would you or I know if God directs something different from what we desire? There's only one way in which we could possibly know, and that is if God has spoken. And God has spoken. And actually, these men knew what He had said. It's 500 years at this point in the Bible story since the Ten Commandments had been given. They knew, thou shalt not murder, and then they knew, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. But they simply ignored what God had said and replaced a faith that is based on revealed truth with the imaginary following of a God who was nothing more than a projection of their own prejudices. You think the Bible speaks to our world today? You see it all around us. What a shock. What a shock it will be for the men of violence who, having convinced themselves that what they're doing is pleasing to God and that He will reward them very, very greatly for what they have done, find to their horror that the living God, who every person on the planet must one day face, that the living God abhors brutality and violence. The case they present, what a disaster. They completely have misunderstood David, and they have completely misunderstood God. Now, they speak, and then David answers. And here we come to the second very important part of this extraordinary scene that's painted for us. Here are these men, you see, and effectively, they're coming into judgment. They really are. They're before God's anointed king. And who is this king that they face? All of this is pointing us forward, of course, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's why we're making the connections all the way through the story. Well, the king that they face is God's king. He's God's anointed king. David answers, as the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from every adversity. I think that must have been a favorite phrase of David's because he not only says it here, he says exactly the same thing again right at the end of his life. It's recorded uh, in 1 Kings and chapter 1 and verse 29. It's almost like this was the motto of his life. And what is he saying? He's saying this, the living God is able to establish my kingdom. The living God in whom I have put my trust, has stood with me in every adversity I have ever faced in my life. You guys think that I need you to establish my kingdom by a brutal act of violence. You do not know the living God. That's what he's saying. God lives. Isn't this a wonderful testimony, by the way? Don't you rejoice to be able to say this as a Christian believer? God lives. And as I look back over my life, this is what David's saying, and this is what we can say, isn't it? God lives, and as I look back over my life, I can see that I have had to face one adversity after another. But God has been faithful to me. 
and he has brought me through them all. He has redeemed my life out of every adversity. If God be for us, who can be against us? He's the one who establishes the kingdom. And if, as the Scriptures tell us, God has indeed exalted Jesus as the anointed king in the highest place, and the Scriptures tell us so clearly that this is what he's done, so that every knee shall bow at the name of Jesus, then guess what? If that's what God has done, every knee will bow at the name of Jesus. He's the living God. And then they come to realize that David is not only God's anointed king, he's actually the king of grace, and this clearly they had never understood or even imagined. It's in verse 10. David recalls a story that is back in 2 Samuel chapter 1. You can check it out later if you want to do that. A story when an enemy came after the battle in which Saul had died, and this enemy falsely claimed that he had been the one to kill Saul, and rather like Banna and Rechab, he did this in order to curry favor with David. He assumed that David would rejoice over the death of Saul, and when he found that David grieved even over the death of his enemy, uh, he found that he had completely miscalculated in making this lying claim. From the beginning, David had been the king of grace. And he cites this story in verse 10 to Bana and Rechab. Think about this. This story is recorded to tell us the kind of things that some men may do if they don't know that God is the God of grace if they don't know that the king is the king of grace. If they had known, put yourself in Banna and Rechab's shoes for a moment, if they had known that the king was the king of grace, they would never have murdered Ishbosheth. What would they have done? They would simply have said, there's a king of grace, and we know we've been on the wrong side, and we know that we're very full of shame for things that we've done that are hidden and all the rest of it, but we don't actually need to do some great thing to curry favor with this king as we imagine him to be. If they knew that he was the king of grace, what would they do? They would come to him, and they would cast themselves on his grace and mercy, and they would receive it in the same way as all the people of Jabesh Gilead were able to receive it when the first thing David did was to send out messengers of grace to the people least likely to receive him. But they don't know, these men of violence. They don't know that the king, who they imagine to be like themselves, is actually the king of grace. I think one of the most fearful things about the day of judgment will be the realization on the part of the wicked that there really was and is grace, and there could have been grace for me. Don't you feel you want to tell the world about grace right now? Don't you feel right now that the world's greatest need is to know that the king is the king of grace? What difference might it have made to these men of violence if they had known this? And then they discover the other thing that is of such importance here, and we should thank God for it, that he is also the king of righteousness. Verse 11, how much more when wicked men have killed a righteous man in his own house on his bed shall I, David says, not now require his blood at your hand and destroy you from the earth. Now, last time, remember, we saw that David failed to bring justice in his kingdom after a brutal murder. But here we do see that David acts rightly in establishing righteousness in his kingdom. Remember now that David was the king. That's very important as we read this. 
And the Scriptures do tell us that the administration of justice is committed by God to the governing authorities. You find that in Romans chapter 13 and verses 1 to 4. And David speaks here as one to whom governing authority had been committed, and the entrusting of justice and the enacting of justice in the kingdom was on his shoulders. And so he deals with Bana, and he deals with Rechab in a way that publicly shows his utter contempt for what they have done. For acts of violence have no place in this kingdom. Not in this kingdom. Here's a kingdom, you see, and this points us forward, doesn't it, to the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a kingdom that, thank God, is different. Here's a kingdom where might does not equal right. Here's a kingdom where the end does not justify the means. Here is a kingdom where whatever advances the cause is not the ethic. Here is a kingdom that prizes righteousness above success. God's anointed King. He is our Jesus, the King of grace, and He is the King of righteousness, and He will deal with the wicked in perfect righteousness. If David had not acted in justice, you know what would have happened? Over a process of time, the kingdom would soon be taken over by violence and by vendettas of men like Bana and Rechab. And you think about this. If God did not bring justice on the final day of judgment, you say, does God really have to do that? Well, if He didn't do that, then Christ's kingdom would be marred by violence and by brutality forever in the same way as our world right now is and has been for centuries. No, God has said nothing unclean will ever enter His kingdom. Revelation 21, 27. Thank God for that. But then as soon as you glimpse the centrality of God's justice, you immediately feel yourself as being utterly dependent upon His grace, especially when you read in the New Testament that whoever hates his brother is already a murderer. So, how does Christ's kingdom come? Well, just panning out to this big story, because this is really what it's all about in these early chapters of Samuel. Christ's kingdom will not advance through the cunning of human schemes. It will not advance through acts of violence. How will it come? And we'll focus on this, God willing, next week. Christ Himself will establish His kingdom, and it will happen as His people reach out with grace. And that's our calling. And that's our privilege, and that is the great need of the world today. And after all these chapters in 2 Samuel, we kind of come back to where we were in the beginning. We've had all the hot-headed force of uh, Joab with all of his bluster. We've had all the political maneuvering and scheming of Abner. Now we've had this brutal violence from Banna and from Rechab. And we come back to this. How is the kingdom going to be advanced? Only in one way. It is God who will give the kingdom to David, and that kingdom will move forward as God's anointed king sends out messengers of grace. Exactly what he did at the beginning. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Christ's kingdom will advance throughout the world by the work of His Spirit inclining men and women to freely embrace His grace because they realize their own need before His justice. And how will they know that there is grace? Because the message of grace is entrusted to people like us. 
the mission of the church really matters in the world today. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, in this brutal and violent world, we thank you for Christ, your anointed King. We thank you that he's the King of grace and that he's the King of justice. And we are overwhelmed with the sense and the marvel of this fact that you have made us, your people, messengers of your grace. Please help us in our spheres of influence individually and together that your kingdom may marvelously move forward among those who right now do not really know who you are and have no really un real understanding of what you desire and what pleases you. And grant that in a world of such violence and strife, messengers of grace may see the advance of your great work for the glory of your Son, in whose name we pray and everyone together said, Amen.